Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends welcome back to this lecture number seven on the course on human behavior now as i keep doing in my all of the lectures what i'll do is i'll start with a brief summary of what we did in the last lectures so we started off this series of lecture on human behavior by dedicating a couple of lectures to understand what is human behavior and what is the science behind human behavior. There we looked at things like why do we need to study human behavior and the answer that we gave there was because people want to uh, control or people want to understand other people so that they have a nice interaction among them. So that was the baseline for understanding human behavior and the science which does it is psychology. So primarily what our aim is is to understand the basics of psychology and how it predicts human behavior through this course. So that was what the basic was. So in the first couple of introductory lectures, we dwelled upon the fact that how do we study human behavior? What is the method of studying human behavior? And what are the questions that needs to be asked? From there on, we quickly shifted into looking at how the science of studying human behavior started. And we looked at inputs from both physiology and philosophy and how these inputs raise certain basic questions about human behavior and human beings in total. Then we went ahead and looked at some schools of psychology which is the science of studying human behavior. So we dwelled upon structuralism, we dwelled upon functionalism, looked at behaviorism, then looked at psychoanalysis and these kind of schools is what we did and we actually looked at and further to that we looked at various perspectives of studying a human behavior. Now as I have outlined before a particular human behavior and for that matter let me clarify what behavior is. Behavior is any reaction or action you do in the presence of a stimuli and this stimuli could be an event, a person and any other thing a situation, environmental situation. So any of them leading you to do a behavior, for example, if the coffee that is served to you is hot, you uh, and after drinking it, you burn your lips. So drinking water to cool off your uh, lips is basically a behavior that you do in relation to the coffee. So basically this is what uh, uh, a human behavior is. And so we looked at how different perspectives can be used to study this particular human behavior or any human behavior for that matter. We looked at the biological perspective, obviously the subjective perspective and the behaviorist perspective, the cognitive perspective and so on and so forth. So that is what we uh, did in the first lecture and towards the end of this lecture, uh, the introductory lecture, we looked at the methods of studying human behavior. Um, for example, we looked at experimentation, we looked at something called observation, the survey met uh, method, the literature review method and all kinds of methods which are employed for studying human behavior. After this, we went into, uh, so if human behavior is to be studied by using these methods, there are the first thing to study human behavior is to identify how humans translate physical stimuluses into uh, the psychological world. So how does the physical uh, stimulus get translated into the psychological world? What are the uh, organ, uh, organs in the human uh, body which does that and how the human body translates any physical stimulus into psychological stimulus? Because within us is the psychological world and outside us is the physical world. So how do we interact with the physical world? And there we looked at the idea of what sensation is. 
So, the sensation the process of converting physical stimuluses into uh, psychological uh, stimulus or psychological matter is what sensation is all about. And in that section we looked at uh, those devices which basically encode these physical stimuluses into uh, psychological stimuluses. So, uh, we looked at parameters like sensitivity and sensory coding. So, two parameters of how the sensory system encodes physical uh, uh, features or physical stimuluses like temperature, like pressure, like uh, light photons, like sound sound waves or uh, these, these kind of uh, these kind of uh, or chemicals which cause you to taste uh, bitterness or sweetness, how this, these are encoded into the psychological realm. Now, two important facts of these of these uh, uh, sensory systems, uh, one is the absolute threshold and the other is a differential threshold is what we looked into further. And further to this, we looked at something called the signal detection theory. Now, signal detection theory, why it is important is as I said, human beings uh, are very uh, bad at judgment, right. The reason being that the human beings use their brain for judging and the brain has a lot of neural noise uh, or for, uh, which it which it makes for doing the basic uh, human activities. And so, within the background of this noise, humans have to detect uh, 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 stimuluses or encode stimuluses and that is why the idea of single detection theory came up of how humans actually uh, do the detection. So, we discuss uh, single detection theory and later on we look at what is sensory encoding, the methods, the biological features or the biological methods of how the physical stimulus is encoded into the psychological world. Towards the end of the lecture, we looked, we took a uh, classic uh, human organ which is the eye and we looked at how does the eye uh, do all these functions of encoding physical stimuluses into the psychological realm. So, there is a classic case that we looked at. The last two lectures we dedicated to perception. So, Assuming that you are able to uh, convert the physical stimuluses or encode the physical stimuluses into the psychological world, this needs to be attached with a meaning and that is what exactly perception does. Perception is basically a feature of the human brain where it takes in physical stimuluses and not only takes in physical stimuluses, organizes them together and makes meaning. So, that is what uh, we looked at in the uh, next lecture which is, which is le lecture number 5 and lecture number 6. And in lecture number 5 we looked at how the brain organizes these uh, physical stimuluses together, not only the organizes these physical stimuluses together, how does it make meaning. And there we understood that the process of perception which is organizing physical stimulus together and uh, deriving meaning from it is a five part process which starts with something called attention, then there is localization, then there is recognition, then there is something called abstraction and then constancy. So, we looked at these five process. Now, uh, attention is the process of putting uh, a filter on to what sensory stimulus should enter <laughs> the psychological realm because if we do not do that, what will happen is all stimuluses will enter. So, we looked at what is attention, we looked at sustained attention and so on and so forth. We moved on to something called localization which is the process of locating where the physical stimulus or the uh, in, in the in the physical domain where is the stimulus finding out where it is. So, we looked at things like uh, background and foreground, uh, finding out how contours are formed, finding out how people perceive distance and so on and so forth. So, localizing in the physical world, in the uh, in, in, in the world outside the psycho, uh, the brain, how uh, location of the object is gathered. Then we looked at in the uh, lecture number 6, we looked at how recognition is done and so we looked at several models, the simple model, the complex network model, the feature detection theory and, uh, and concepts like uh, recognition parameters of how uh, something or how an object when it is uh, located in the physical environment, how make meaning is made uh, of it or how it is recognized. So, what is the process of recognition? So, we not only looked at words and letters of recognition, we also looked at natural object recognition of how natural object recognition works and we looked at the idea of zeons and those kind of things in this lecture. Later on we moved on something called two processes of abstraction and constancy, abstraction being the process of 
narrowing down the type of information we actually need from a whole lot of physical information which is available to us and constancy being the property of the brain to hold certain stimuluses constant to hold certain properties of uh, sti uh, external stimulus as fixed and this is required because if it keeps on changing then meaning cannot be derived of uh, st uh, physical stimuluses. So, that is a capsule of what we did up till now. Now, what we are going to do today is take another topic which is of interest. So, assuming that we have uh, interacted with the physical world and make meaning out of it, the next step is an advanced process in human behavior which is called learning and uh, conditioning. So, the topic for today's discussion would be learning and conditioning. So, what is learning and why do we need to learn? Now, learning is a process or learning is a phenomena which happens to most of us and an associated phenomena with this is memory because learning cannot happen on its own. So, learning is a process through which people uh, gather information, organize information and use this information later uh, at, at some point of time for their own benefit. So, learning is basically a phenomena like that. Now, this learning that we are talking about is an important part because if we if the <coughs> If we do not learn, what is going to happen is that we will not be able to gather knowledge. So, learning is a process of gathering this knowledge and organizing it together and not only organizing it together, using it for our benefits and then sometimes we also let go of earlier learning and uh, start with a new learning. So, learning is a process which not only makes you gather knowledge, it also makes you move ahead in this world. Now, <laughs> this learning that we are talking about is basically of two different types. We have something called the non-associative and we have something called the associative form. Now, one of the uh, interesting thing about learning is something called classical conditioning is a form of learning and that is what we will be doing today. So, not only distinguishing what is learning and we will look at what is classical conditioning. And so, to prove how learning is important to us, let us take a look at an experiment. Now, suppose you want a person to actually increase a particular behavior, to actually increase a particular act. How do you do that? And you can do that by using one of the principles of learning which is called classical conditioning. So, let us see how, uh, how this situation really stands here. So, you have a friend of yours who is in the habit of actually touching his hair each time or he has, he plays with his hair a lot. So, he runs his fingers with his hair a lot. Now, this is the behavior which you target on and you want this person to increase this behavior. Now, one way to do this is to ask this person to uh, play with his hair more, but this is a direct approach and this is not learning. And so, he may question you back saying that why should I do it, right. But then there is another method of making this person do this behavior without this person knowing that you have used the principles of learning for making him do this behavior. So, how do you do it? You use something called classical conditioning. We will discuss classical conditioning in a while, but let us see how this can be done, how this magic happens. So, what we do is that the first step is reinforcing him. So, each time this person runs his uh, hand in the uh, through the hair, you give him a compliment, right? And you keep on doing it. Each time he runs his uh, fingers uh, through the hair, you compliment him and you keep on doing it again and again. And after a certain period of time, what happens is this person's frequency of running the hair in his uh, in his head increases. And so, even if you do not compliment him, this frequency will increase. Because what has happened is the frequency of running the hair, which is a response, which is the neutral response, is now binded with a positive reward, which is your praise to him. And later on, if you ask him the question of why are you doing what you are doing, why are you uh, uh, or are you uh, doing this because I have given you a praise, this person is not going to accept your answer and the uh, the increase in the or increase in the frequency of playing with the hair will uh, will be very high so this is the kind of thing that learning can do it can make you uh, do behaviors can make uh, you play with people not actually play with people uh, to actually interact with people in a way and learn things and and make them learn things in in, in in a way which will benefit not only you, but the other people who are interacting with you. So, let us understand what is learning and let us go into the section of what is learning and what is conditioning and how does it all work around. So, the topic for today's discussion is learning and conditioning. As you see, 
this cartoon very briefly describes what learning is all about. On this side, as you see, I have cut out the captions, but the caption read that this father is doing the, the work of this child and what has happened is each time the child, father stops doing the work, the child actually cries. What the child is doing is watching the television and the child has now understood the principle of learning that if he throws a tantrum, the father is going to actually do the homework and that is one reason why how learning can really work or in this case what has happened is this person on the right hand side what what he is trying to do is trying to learn how to manage his books with uh, rewards as you see there is a drinking reward and there is an eating reward and that is how this thing works out. So, let us quickly look into what is learning and what is conditioning the definitions of it. So, learning the definition of what learning is is learning is defined as a relatively permanent change in behavior that occurs due to experience. So, learning has been defined as a relatively permanent change in behavior that occurs due to experience. Now, let us break this definition. Relatively permanent change in behavior occurs due to experience. So, let us look at how this definition can be actually used. So, the first part of the definition is it is a relatively permanent change. What is the meaning of relatively permanent change? What is the meaning of relatively permanent change? It says that the change that you are seeing in people's behavior is, per, is relatively permanent which means that it is not permanent and so the change in behavior which happens due to learning can always go back to the original behavior. Second thing, change in behavior. So, it is relatively permanent. What is relatively permanent? Relative to the earlier, uh, earlier situation and what is permanent? The behavior. So, behavior can go back to the original and it occurs due to experience. So, how, why, how or why does it occur? It occurs because there are certain experiences and these experiences actually make you do learning or these experiences actually make you uh, go through learning. Now, as I said before, there are two kinds of learning. The first kind being the non-associative, which involves learning about a single stimulus and includes habituation and sensation. Right. So, there are two kinds of learning. Basically, what what we did uh, now is we looked at the definition of learning, and we there looked at there are two kinds of learning. One is called the non-associative form of learning, and the other is called the associative form of learning. And we'll quickly look into the definitions of it. So, basically, learning. has been defined as a relatively permanent what a change behavior which happens through experience. So, relatively permanent, the definition of relatively permanent says that it can go back. So, learning is reversible first thing. Second, a change in behavior, change in what? A change in behavior, a change in your actions and the third is how is it caused? So, how is learning caused? What changes? And how it is caused? So, it is caused by experience, which basically means that the primary cause of learning is memory and past knowledge. So, this is what the definition of learning is. Now, as I said, this learning that we are uh, talking about are of two types. We can have a single stimulus learning or we can have a multiple stimulus learning. So, single stimulus learning. or we can have multiple stimulus learning. So, single stimulus learning is called the non-associative form. And the multiple stimulus is called the associative form. So, what is the single stimulus learning? The non-associative form. In the non-associative form of learning, there is no association. So, a single stimulus is used 
people learn from a single stimulus, people learn from manipulating a stimulus, single stimulus and in the multiple stimulus or the associative learning, what happens is people learn to associate, people learn to associate two or more stimuli. They learn to associate two or more stimuli and through that they learn and within the single stimulus learning are two forms, we have something called habituation or sensitization and within the multiple form where we learn to associate multiple stimuluses together and from there we learn or we learn to associate multiple stimuluses together and that makes the change in behavior. There are two forms of it, we have something called classical conditioning we have something called instrumental conditioning or in some books they would talk about operant conditioning and the third is called complex learning or sometimes it is also called social learning or observation learning for that matter. So, basically this is what my learning is all about and so what is the non-associative form of learning? The non-associative form of learning this it involves learning about a single stimulus that includes habituation and uh, sensitization. Now, let us look at what is habituation, what is the meaning of habituation? So, habituation is a character uh, is characterized by a decrease in behavioral response to a innocuous stimulus example repeated sounding of horns decreases the start response. So, what is habituation? Habituation is a process where what happens is that when when you when a, a, a stimulus inoculus stimulus is presented to you multiple times what you tend to do is you tend to start responding lesser and lesser to this stimulus and that is what is in habituation. So, think of a situation in which a friend of your decided to uh, surprise you to give you a startled response and what he does is he stands inside his room or your room with a horn and when you enter the room it is all pitch black and he blows this horn and so you become startled. Now, he tries to do this n number of times, he tries, he, he, he star, starts feeling smart and he believes that he can do this with uh, you for every day or play around with you for every day and so he does this for multiple number of days. There will be a time when he blows the horn when you enter the room and nothing happens because you, it is it is habituation, you are habituated to it and so you show no reaction. For the first couple of days, maybe 2-3 days, you will show a subtle response but other than that you won't. So, here the kind of learning that has happened, the kind of uh, behavioral change where from startle to no startle that you have come up with is basically a form of learning which is called habituation. Now, let us look at what is sensitization. Now, sensitization is a process, it is a learning process process whereby there is an increase in the behavioral response to a intense stimulus. Example, horn startle is greatly enhanced before entering a dark alley uh, as the horn sounds. Now, you are uh, still with the startle response and so what has happened is since you enter this um, uh, room again and again and the startle response has gone because you know or you are prepared that this friend of yours are going is going to startle. But imagine one of these days you are walking back to your hostel, to your room wherever you live and suddenly the, uh, the light goes off and you turn into an alley or you turn into uh, your hostel gate and everything is pitch black and the, uh, and the response or the startle, uh, uh, the horn is again blown. What will happen is your immediate response, the startle will again come back with a heightened uh, uh, frequency with a heightened amplitude. So, you will will be more startled and that is what is sensitization. So, situation environmental situation makes you startle more because initially you were startled with the response, but then you have learned it not to get startled, but then certain environmental factors make the situation make you respond more intensely to the horn uh, to uh, provide more startled uh, uh, activity to the response to the horn and that is basically what is called sensitization. So, there are two forms in sensitization, one single stimulus is the is the cause of all learning to happen. On the other hand, I have the associative form of learning where more complex 
uh, stimulus as it involves learning about relationships among events and includes classical conditioning and instrumental conditioning. So, in this case, in the case of associative learning what happens is more complex stimuluses are involved and what people learn is how to associate a stimulus with another stimulus or a stimulus with a particular kind of a response. So, understanding stimulus stimulus relations how a stimulus A is related to a stimulus B or how a stimulus A is related to a response B and what should be done to increase the behavior or decrease the stimulus intensity is what is associative form of learning. There are two in nature we have something called classical conditioning and we have something called instrument conditioning. So, then look let us look at what is classical conditioning. So, classical conditioning learning process in which previously neutral stimulus becomes associated with another stimulus through repeated pairing with that stimulus. So, classical conditioning is a form of learning where what happens is that learning happens uh, in, in this way that a previously neutral object or previous neutral stimulus it becomes associated with another stimulus with another uh, object through repeated pairing with that particular stimulus. So, we will quickly uh, uh, understand that I will uh, make you understand this particular thing and we will also look at uh, the various definitions that I am uh, I'm, I'm describing here in one second. Before that let me clarify what is classical conditioning. So, here you have an object which is not uh, reacting to anything which is not responsible for anything and then you have a uh, another object which is producing a response. So, the uh, the process through which you take this neutral object which, which does not produce any response and uh, fix it in such a way or use this neutral stimulus in such a way. So, that it starts producing the same response or equal response uh, as, as the other stimulus which is already producing a response is what is classical conditioning. So, the the power or, or the process of providing the power of uh, to a neutral stimulus to produce a response of a desired intensity of a desired uh, markability is what is classical conditioning. So, it all started the idea of classical conditioning started from Pavlov's experience or Pavlov's la uh, lab where he was training a dog. Now, as you know Ivan Pavlov was a Russian uh, phys uh, physiologist and he was working with digestive systems of dog. He got a Nobel prize with that, but not only the Nobel prize he is also known for it for uh, making people understand associative learning and one of the most premium definitions of associative learning which is the classical conditioning. So, what Pavlov's experiment was Pavlov's research involved measuring dogs salivation in response to food and found that dogs begin to salivate when they saw the food dish. So, what was the experiment that Pavlov have? What Pavlov was doing is he was measuring the amount of salivation that the dog produces when he actually sees the food right. So, that was what the experiment was and so what happened is he saw one day that when the uh, person who brings the food he comes closer uh, together or he comes into uh, the picture the dogs started salivating even before the meat powder was given to uh, given to the dog. So, which basically means that the dog was doing some anticipation or dog was something was happening. So, that even before the meat powder was given to the dog, the dog started salivating just at the sight of the person who brings the meat powder. And so, you he used this concept and in this concept uh, of how the dog salivating even before the meat powder was given because normally the dog should salivate to the meat powder, but he was just salivating to the person appearing. So, he used a light bulb and in uh, he used to light the light bulb uh, and after that give the meat powder and slowly slowly what happened is after multiple number of times he did this experiment uh, when, when the light bulb was kept on the dog start responding or the dog starts showing salivation and that was what the original experiment was Pavlov was. Now, before we go any further let us look at how does uh, this thing really work. So, before defining classical conditioning or how does classical conditioning really work, let us look at some of the primary uh, terms that we are going to work with. Now, unconditioned stimulus is the, the stimulus which produces the response. Unconditioned stimulus is the stimulus uh, in, in a classical conditioning setting which automatically produces the response. Unconditioned response is the response which happens on its own, it is not conditioned which means that it is a natural response. Neutral stimulus is a stimulus which is an unrelated event like light or in, in case of Pavlov the presence of the helper is what is the unconditioned uh, the neutral stimulus. 
now how it happens during conditioning pair present presentation of food with light and after a number of pairings dog will salivate when light is on now condition stimulus is the light and condition response is the salivation condition stimulus is non condition stimulus or the neutral stimulus after a number of pairings becomes the condition stimulus and the response non condition stimulus uh, response is what is produced by the condition stimulus so let's look at what is this classical conditioning all about classical conditioning and what I'll do is I will use Pavlov's method for the ease of people or their who are learning. So basically there is something called the in step 1 there is something called the unconditioned stimulus which produces the unconditioned response right what is the meaning of this meat is the unconditioned stimulus and the unconditioned response is the salivation natural response right so in this response as you see in step 1 there is a meat powder and this meat powder when it is presented to the dog and the person or, or the uh, <coughs> device on which this conditioning is going on is the dog. So as you present the meat powder the dog salivate and this is a natural thing because any dog you take you give meat to the dog the dog will salivate and this is called the neutral stimulus this is called the I am sorry the natural uh, pairing this is called the unconditioned the meat is called the unconditioned stimulus and salivation is called the unconditioned response the reason being that this is natural pairing or this is something which is natural happens on its own. Now in step 2 now what I want is I want the dog to salivate for something called the neutral stimulus. So neutral stimulus is a tone right so some tone I present and when this tone is presented to the dog there is no response because this is learned this is not that natural this is artificial or this is learned. So in one case when I present the meat powder the dog responds on its own nothing has to be learned and this is natural reaction and then I present a tone or I present a voice to the dog the dog does not respond shows no response to it or particularly it shows uh, I would not say no response it does not show the response of salivation because the dogs are not known to salivate for tones. Now the question is what I want is so what I want is I what I want so as I said in classical conditioning I relate stimuluses together and so what I want is I want the dog to salivate for the tone can I do it now the problem is that dogs do not salivate for tones right and it is a difficult problem dogs will salivate for meat powder dogs will salivate for some other thing but tones are something which the dogs is not going to salivate my response is uh, the, the salivation can I make the dog salivate for the tone that is what the question is and that is what even Pavlovian wanted and that is what the basic classical conditioning is. So can I make the dog salivate for tone that is what the question so I what I do is in step 3 to achieve this particular thing to achieve this what I do is I present the neutral stimulus first and then I present the unconditioned stimulus which is the meat powder and if I do this the dog will show an unconditioned response which is salivation. So what I have done is I have only included this step. So what I have done is I have presented the tone first and immediately following the tone or within the tone itself when the tone was being presented towards the end of the tone I presented the meat powder. Now the dog was known to salivate for meat powder so it is going to salivate for 
meat powder and that is what it is. And now I have to do this pairing or now I have to carry out this step where I use the tone and the meat for let us say multiple times. So, n equals to n plus 1 times right or i equals to i plus plus in terms of C plus plus language, it has an iteration. So, if I do this, let us say for 1000 times, what will happen is after 1000 pairings, after 1000 repetitions of this step, my step number 3, there will be a time which will come where when I just present my neutral stimulus, which now becomes the condition stimulus. So, now my after a multiple number of times, this neutral stimulus is no more neutral stimulus, it becomes the condition stimulus and I do not give the meat powder, the dog produces salivation or the dog salivate to the tone, but this is now called the condition response and not the unconditioned response. So, in this case what has happened is the tone, the CS produces the CR, the CR is actually equivalent to the UCR, but stains still the UCR is the response which is being produced by the meat powder, the CR is the same response that is there, but now it is being produced by the tone. And so, what will happen is for the next 2 or 3 trials, for the next couple of trials, maybe say 2 or 4 trials, what is going to happen is the tone is going to produce the salivation. But soon the dog will understand that this is this meat powder is not coming, I am just responding to the tone. And so, in step 5 what will happen is, let us say at the 7th or 8th trial or after trial number 7 to 8, what is going to happen is tone when you present to it, the dog condition stimulus no response and this is called extinction. So, up till now is what is up till this is what is called classical conditioning. So, what I have done is what I have achieved is I have achieved something where I make a neutral stimulus which was a tone produce a response which the dog would not have produced on his own, would not have generated on his own, right. And so, if I do step number 4, uh, step number 3 multiple number of times, the dog will now salivate to the tone, but sooner or later the dog will realize that the tone is not producing or tone is not giving any meat powder and he will not respond. But up till now what I have done is this is a remarkable feat, step number 4 is a remarkable feat. Because what I have done here is that I have made somebody do something which they would normally not do, right? Interesting, that is what classical conditioning is all about. So, all those situations where you go to the market and something is offered free to you, what they are doing is you are, they are using the method of classical conditioning. The idea is that when something is given free to you, the word free is the reward that you have and so that reward makes you buy something. And so, uh, for understanding this thing, we can also uh, explain classical conditioning as something called reward contingent behavior is what or reward con, uh, contingent conditioning is what is called classical conditioning. So, in a, in a classical conditioning what happens is generally what happens is that there is a behavior or there is an act and if this behavior is rewarded, it is added with a reward, a change happens in this behavior is what is classical conditioning. So, this reward makes you change the uh, this behavior to this behavior and that is what is classical conditioning. In classical conditioning, the change in behavior happens because of the reward and if you pull out the reward, if you pull out the serve. So, all those times when you went to supermarket and uh, a, a 10 liter or 20 liter bucket was being given to you, if you buy serve, the 10 liter, 20 liter, liter bucket is the reward which is there. In this case, the UCS meat is the reward and as, as the reward is given to you, the dog learns to salivate. So, it is reward contingent uh, conditioning where a reward is given to you and because of the reward, you do a particular behavior. So, you salivate, the dog salivates not because he hears the tone, because tone has no power itself, but why he is producing this response is because he is expecting a reward or the reward has made him actually do that. So, all those times when the bucket was taken away, 
you still buy surf for a couple of times and then you do not buy it anymore because you are buying it for the bucket. So, those 4 5 times when you actually brought it without the bucket is what classical conditioning is the power of classical conditioning is. So, as you see this is before conditioning. So, this is what my neutral stimulus is a light and this is the pairing it is step number 3. As you can see what has happened is there is a light, there is a meat and the dog is salivating. This is unconditioned response, this is the unconditioned stimulus. And during conditioning what is happening is this is, so initially, so this is step number 2, the light produces no response, but the meat powder produces response and this produces no response. Now, during conditioning what happens is this is step number 3 and this is step number 4. So, in step number 3, the light is paired together, this comes together, so the dog is salivating for both the pair together this comes first this comes seconds so first comes the light then comes the meat powder and later on after conditioning what happens is even if the light is given so now my neutral stimulus has become the ucs and my unconditioned response has become the conditioned response because what has happened is this light is producing the salivation and that is the baseline of all classical conditioning so it is called the reward contingent conditioning that is what classical conditioning is all about. So, it is easy to understand right. So, some something is given to you and you do a particular act because of that particular thing is what is classical conditioning. So, some basic principles of classical conditioning let us look at some basic principles. First acquisition the course of classical conditioning. There are two parts of classical conditioning the time when you learn and the time that uh, the, the behavior goes down. So, looking back here, this is the acquisition phase 1 to 3. So, 1 to 3 steps are called the acquisition phase because you learn here and this is called the extinction phase because you forget here, right. So, acquisition phase, acquisition. The process of pairing condition stimulus with condition response proceeds quite rapidly at first, increases as the number of pairings between CS and UCS increases. However, after a while the acquisition slows down. So, if I pair this this way, what happens is if this is the number of trials 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 and this is the drops of salivation. what will happen is initially the curve will go like this and then it will start dropping. So, by 8th trial they will have maximum number of salivation and this is called the acquisition phase. So, initially what happens is it proceeds quite rapidly at first increasing the number of pairing between CS and US increases as we keep on increasing the number of pairings increases. However, after a while the acquisition slows down. So, by after 10 trial it starts going down and this is called the acquisition phase. Also, beside acquisition, conditioning is also affected by temporal arrangement of CSUS pairing, some possible temporal pairings are presented. So, there are number of principles, there are number of factors which control this classical conditioning. One is the acquisition. What happens is that the more number of frequency pairings, the number of pairings of the neutral stimulus to uh, the unconditioned stimulus that you do, the higher the learning will be or the higher the conditioning will be. Now, what is going to happen is, but then after a certain number of trials, this, this uh, dog is not going to learn anything. It will play too off because it has only learned the response and so the salivation will go down. So, initial at the initial stage of learning, initial stage of pairing, the, the number of drops of saliva will increase, but as that happens, there will be a play too and from there on what will happen is the saliva draws will decrease because it has learned this connection, right. But not only this acquisition is going to decide how classical co uh, conditioning proceeds. It is also the arrangement of how, where the neutral stimulus is presented or how the unconditioned stimulus is presented. So, how the pairing is done. So, let us look at some of these. Now, there are four different ways in which you can pair the stimulus. For example, now the uh, one way is neutral stimulus plus unconditioned stimulus will give unconditioned response it is one. I can also have unconditioned stimulus plus neutral stimulus giving me unconditioned response this is two. I can have 
unconditioned stimulus and neutral stimulus occurring together giving unconditioned response or I can have unconditioned stimulus and if it has not finished within that I have the neutral stimulus being presented. So, simultaneous uh, not simultaneously, but one over another the overlapping one and I have unconditioned response. So, this is my scene number 3, this is my scene number 4. So, let us look at these temporal presentations the way this is related whether it has any effect on classical conditioning or how you learn using classical conditioning. Let us look at that. So, one is called the forward conditioning. The presentation of the conditioned stimulus always precedes the presentation of the unconditioned stimulus. So, neutral stimulus proceeds UCS, this is called the forward conditioning. Then there is something called delay conditioning is a form uh, of forward conditioning in which the onset of the unconditioned stimulus UCS begins while the conditioned stimulus CS is still present. So, uh, this UCS actually begins. So, I have my neutral stimulus still here and then my UCS begins with this. So, this two 4 and 1, these are the two forms of it. There is a form of conditioning or there is a type of conditioning which is called trace conditioning, a form of forward conditioning in which the onset of the CS precedes the UCS and presentation of the CS and UCS does not overlap. So, uh, this is another form of uh, conditioning where CS comes beforehand. And the fourth form is the simultaneous conditioning, a form of conditioning in which the conditioned stimulus C s and the unconditioned stimulus U C s begins at the same time. So, my C s and U C s starting at the same time to form the unconditioned response. So, four types of conditioning. And then I have something called backward conditioning, it is a type of conditioning in which the presentation of the unconditioned stimulus precedes the presentation of the unconditioned. So, so my U C s starts first my neutral stimulus starts second and I have UCR here and here obviously the trace conditioning I have neutral stimulus coming first, the UCS coming afterwards and then the UCR or the response. Now, my questions to you is in which of this case do you think the conditioning will be better, the learning will be better right what is your answer and why you think that answer is there if you can guess that. Now, the answer typically is backward conditioning will have the worst kind of conditioning the reason being that the meat powder is already present, meat powder is already given to the dog and then you give the tone the dog does not pay attention to the tone and so your conditioning will be the poorest. If you present the meat powder and the tone at the same time, the dog pays attention to the meat powder, does not pay attention to the tone and so the conditioning will be poor here. If you look here, onset of the unconditioned stimulus begins while the conditioned stimulus is still present. If UCS neutral stimulus is here and the UCS starts. So, the tone is there and still the tone is going on and within that you start the meat powder, the conditioning is the best here or the learning is the best here. Why? Because the dog is still listening to the tone and as he is listening to the tone, the food is presented to him. So, or the meat is presented to him. So, he forms the quickest association because the tone is still going on and he has been listening to the tone for quite some time and then the meat powder uh, uh, comes along and he produces the response. So, he learns the faster. In this case where the neutral stimulus or the tone has ended and after that a delay you have the meat powder coming in the dog cannot make any relation between how the tone and the meat powder is related and so here even the trace conditioning the conditioning will be poorer and so this is the best kind of conditioning or delay conditioning is the best kind of conditioning which is going to happen. Now, there are several other conditions that appear or factors that appear to affect conditioning. One of these factors, so these are the four uh, conditioning that, that you see, this is the forward conditioning. So, as you see this is called the delay conditioning, you see the light comes before the tone starts even when the light is on and so this is the best kind of conditioning, I will write the best here. In this what has happened is there is a gap between the presentation of the meat, so this is my meat and this is my light and so the dog forgets. In this case they are happening together, the dog cannot distinguish between this and in this case 
the meat powder is already there, the tone comes afterwards and in this case I am not using the meat powder, it is the case of giving electrical shock and so in this case what happens is the dog cannot make any association because he is busy eating the meat. Now there are several factors which are going to affect classical conditioning, let us start to have a look at these factors. One of the factors that is going to affect classical conditioning uh, is the intensity of either the conditioned stimulus or the unconditioned uh, stimulus increases. Now, if the intensity of either the conditioned stimulus or unconditioned stimulus increases, then condition will be faster. For example, instead of the meat powder, if you give something desirable to the dog, right, the intensity increases, you give more meat powder to the dog, right, or in one case is what happens is if something which is very dear to the dog or if I am using instead of the dog some other animal, let us say I am using chimpanzee. So, if you give meat powder to chimpanzee, it is not going to work. So, you have to give him banana, give the dog something that it likes and if you, if you do that, the conditioning will be higher. But the question here is the intensity, which means that if the higher um, amount of meat powder that you give, the higher the conditioning will be. So, intensity of either the condition stimulus which is the, uh, the, the light in this case or unconditional stimulus which is the meat powder. Any of this increases, there will be an increase in the uh, learning because more meat powder means more, uh, uh, more um, salivation and more uh, higher tone means faster learning. Similarly, conditioning also depends on the time interval between presentations. How many, uh, how much time he is uh, being spared between or used between these presentations of the two stimuli. Extremely short intervals of less than 0 0.2 seconds rarely produce any conditioning. So, you have to have some kind of type uh, interval between multiple sets of repetition. Remember uh, step 3 from the drawing that I did before. So, this step 3 where the multiple iterations of a trial is done of a neutral stimulus plus condition stimulus, unconditioned stimulus giving to unconditioned response, this, this step is carried out. So, between these steps, between the multiple occurrences of this step, there has to be some gap. If it is very less, then conditioning is not going to happen. If it is very high, again conditioning is not going to happen. And the, uh, the th third thing is familiarity can greatly affect conditioning. Instead of the meat powder, try giving the dog something which it does not understand, right? There will be no conditioning. Instead of the meat powder, give him pizza. Both are foods, the dog will not understand and there will be no conditioning at all. Or if, if the meat powder is there and instead of the light, because the light was always present in the lab, so the, uh, so the dog understood that he has to respond to it. But if you bring a stimulus which was not originally present in the in the situation, for example, in the, in the example that I gave to you, with surf, you have to only use buckets. If you start giving chips packet with surfs, it is not going to work because this, this do not say familiarity, this do not go together and that way surf is not going to increase its production or you are not going to increase the sales of surf. So, what has happened, what has to happen? The familiarity has to be there, the equality has to be there and so, the more familiar the person who is learning is with the kind of stimuluses which is to be used, the higher the learning will be or the faster the learning will be. Classical conditioning, basic principles and so one of the basic principles is extinction, one conditioning is over, how to get rid of it. So, once the dog and I have explained that step number 5 in uh, in the drawing that I do, I saw there is something called, I, I told there is something called extinction. So, what happens is, initially what happens is, this is my acquisition phase. So, initially what will happen is, the salivation will, this is my salivation, this end and this is my number of trials. So, initially what will happen is, salivation will go on increasing, but after the uh, time when you just have the tone and the tone produces the salivation, uh, there will be a drop, a higher drop will be there where what will happen is although if it will not touch the x axis, what will happen is the percent of salivation will go down and this is the number of trials. So, percentages of salivation will keep on going down and this is what is called extinction. So, what is extinction? Extinction is a process where the dog realizes that he is only getting the tone and he is producing salivation to the tone. So, he should not produce the salivation that is what is extinction. The extinction is the process through which a condition stimulus gradually loses the ability to evoke condition response when it is no longer followed by the unconditioned stimuluses. So, tone giving salivation is only going to work for 4 to 5 trials. After that, there will be extinction which means that tone 
on the sixth trial the tone produces no response and this is what is called condi uh, extinction. Now, there is also a process which is called reconditioning and what is reconditioning is the rapid recovery of a condition response to a CSUS pairing following extinction. Immediately after extinction there will be what will happen is so uh, from trial 6 to trial 10 what will happen is the dog is not going to respond and so after 10 trial let us say on 11th trial what you do is you take the tone and add the meat here on the 11th trial. The response will be faster the dog responds much faster to the meat pot the salivation is higher this is called reconditioning. So, after a period when there is no meat powder given and suddenly you start giving meat powder the amount of salivation will increase very high and this is called reconditioning. And there is a process which is called spontaneous recovery is the reappearance of a weakened condition response to a condition stimulus after an interval of time following extinction. Let us say extinction happens on the sixth trial on the uh, from sixth trial onwards the dog does not respond or 6th, 7th, 8th trial onwards or 9th, 10th trial the dog understands that only tone is being produced and I should not salivate. If I wait for some more time, stop this process, wait for some more time and after some more time what happens is that I gave the dog again. So, let us say after a wait of 1 hour, I again produce the tone, the dog is quickly going to salivate this is what is called spontaneous recovery. So, if there is a time gap between the presentation of the neutral stimulus and the condition response then there is a spontaneous recovery which means that salivation increases very high. Now, there is also something called generalization and discrimination responding to similarity and differences. So, what is uh, stimulus generalization? Stimulus generalization is the tendency of stimuli similar to condition response to evoke condition uh, response. What happens is if in your classical conditioning study we have used a tone, this tone could be coming from a bell. So, instead of an electrical bell, if I use a mechanical bell or if I use a tuning fork or if I use some other amplified uh, digital bell which is out there and the dog will respond to it is what is called stimulus similarity. Stimulus similarity is when the dog starts responding to or people who are conditioned start responding to stimuluses which are similar together in a same manner as to the neutral stimulus or the stimulus that that we were uh, trained to is what is called stimulus similarity. And then there is a concept of something called stimulus discrimination in which uh, people uh, try to discriminate between two stimuluses which are uh, looking uh, similar. So, the process by which organisms learn to respond to certain stimuli, but not to others. Let us say that <coughs> I make friends with dogs and so what happens is I like all dogs, but one day one dog bit me. So, uh, initially what happened is through stimulus, uh, uh, stimulus generalization I started making or patting all dogs and one day one of these dogs actually bit me. Now what has happened is I will respond to certain kind of dogs and not respond to other kind of dogs. This is called stimulus discrimination. So, in, in stimulus generalization I start responding similarly to all dogs in stimulus discrimination among dogs also I tried responding uh, uh, friendly to some kind of dogs and unfriendly to other kinds of dogs and this is called stimulus discrimination a process through which I discriminate between all kind of dogs. Now, there are certain biological constraints to classical conditioning. For example, to some extent animals are pre-programmed to learn particular thing or particular way. So, one of the thing or uh, one of the uh, uh, biological constraints in classical conditioning is that classical conditioning does not work freely the way it is. There are certain biological limits to it. For example, I will give, give a good example. Let us say that you actually go to a restaurant and the restaurant gives you a food and you eat that food and that food causes you food poisoning. Will you go to that restaurant again and again to learn that this restaurant is actually causing me food poisoning? Will you visit that restaurant again? No, just one visit to the restaurant and the restaurant food giving you food poisoning is enough to say that I am not going to go to the restaurant. But liking that restaurant is a reverse process. You go to the restaurant again and again and start enjoying the food and because of that you go again and again. So, multiple pairings are required for you to like the restaurant, but disliking the restaurant is a one process thing. 
it gives you food poisoning, you do not feel good and you will never go to the restaurant and that is called uh, biological constraints. So, like for in uh, in rats also this has been turned uh, tested which is called the learn taste aversion. So, bad experience with certain kind of food puts a person off that particular food, but this conditioning does not entirely comply with classical conditioning. Taste aversion com uh, common after just one bad experience, no repeated pairing and CSUS interval usually is very long number of hours there is an immediate. So, in this case of uh, what happens is you do not need to go to the restaurant again and again and also the time limit is multiple hours. So, you ate at the restaurant let us say at 8 am or 10 am and then later in the night you get food poisoning, but still you remember that you ate in that restaurant and that causes you to uh, avoid that restaurant or understand that it is causing you food poisoning. Now, let us look at why do we have this classical conditioning, the cognitive perspective to it. So, classical conditioning involves more than simple associations, it is not simple behaviorist theory, it is not simple the idea that a stimulus is related to the response and that is why classical conditioning happening. So, regular pairing of CS with UCS provides subjects with a valuable predictive information. Thus, as conditioning proceeds, subjects acquire expectation that a CS will be followed. So, why does it happen? It happens because the dog can now predict as you go on and on, as you go pairing the neutral stimulus which is uh, basically the tone with the food that you are giving to it or the meat pot that you are giving to it, the dog is now able to predict and with this predict prediction, with this predictive power, it expects the food to come. So, all those times when the tone, the neutral stimulus or the tone was presented, the dog is actually making prediction and expecting the meat to come and because it is expecting the meat to come, it is salivating. So, it is not simple tone producing salivation, it goes through a process which is the process of expectation. So, the dog is expecting the meat to come and that is why it is responding. Now, the idea that cognitive processes involving expectation plays a role in classical conditioning is a thesis supported by several types of evidence. Now, the question is, is it true? is it how things really work and there are several evidence to it. First, conditioning fails to occur when CS, US are paired in random order. So, let us say when I am doing step number 3, on some trials, let us say trial number 1, uh, 4, 5, 9, 10, 14, 18, I give the dog the tone and the uh, meat powder and in uh, and in some trials I may not give him the uh, meat powder. Now, in those conditions what is going to happen is the dog is not going to learn anything and this conditioning fails. Secondly, the cognitive thesis is supported by a phenomena known as something called blocking. The fact that conditioning to one stimulus may be prevented by previous conditioning to another stimulus. So, if what happens is, if the dog has been conditioned to let us say pizza and uh, or some other kind of food and uh, this food is likable by the dog, the dog will never learn to get conditioned by the meat powder whenever the first food is present and this is called blocking and this is another fact to be looked at and this supports the fact that it is expectation in the dog and the predictive power the dog has that uh, makes you come up with answers or come up with conditioning. The idea that cognitive processes play a role in cl classical conditioning is also supported by studies of mental imagery. The main question addressed by this research is whether mental imagery or stimuluses can substitute for their physical counterparts and a cognitive process. The thesis has been successfully tested. Part of the answer to the puzzle lies in the fact that mental imagery makes people mentally scan an object leading to an eye movement which indicates movement when actually scanning a physical object. And so, there were some imagery studies done and these imagery studies what they actually uh, did was that these imagery uh, studies made people respond or imagine. So, uh, in one case they were asked to move a cup from a position A to B and in some, uh, uh, some situations they were asked to imagine moving a cup from A to B. Now, what happened is in these studies it was found out that when the people were actually doing or they were trying to learn conditioning using imagery, they were using the same mental processes as they were in the non-imagery group and so this another, this is another thesis which supports the fact that it is the cognitive perspective, it is the predictive power and expectation that develops in the, uh, in the, in the organism or in the subject which lets him do the uh, or understand the, uh, the, the classical conditioning or perform in the classical conditioning. Now, let us do a recap. What we did today in this lecture is we started by explaining what is learning, what is learning and the types of forms of learning with it and further to that what we did was we 
evaluated one of the forms of cl classical conditioning, one of the forms of as assertive conditioning which is classical conditioning. So, on one hand you have non-associative conditioning which is basically a single stimulus conditioning which is habituation and sensitization and on the other hand you have associative conditioning which is basically uh, classical conditioning and instrumental conditioning. What we did today is we looked at classical conditioning, what is it, what are the factors which affects it and what are the cognitive perspectives to it and how does it work. So, those things which we looked at and in the next upcoming lecture we are going to take the other kind of associative conditioning which is there which is instrumental conditioning and something called social learning or as we call it observation learning. So, up till we meet again next time it is goodbye from here.